Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big People Talk. My name is Nanika Edwards, and in this video, we're going to be looking at Chinese script as a way of developing our critical thinking skills. Now, you don't need to have any prior knowledge of Chinese to be able to appreciate this video. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. Um, I would encourage you to just, you know, try to stick it through and see whether this is for you or not. So my background is in Chinese studies um, and I have taught Chinese for many years and in teaching Chinese, I've learned how to decipher some of the script. So I'm going to share some of that knowledge with you in this video. We're going to be looking at the word repent, which is a word that you can see at the top of the screen. As you can see, the slide is, um, the slide is color coded. I color coded the font so that the lesson would be a little easier to follow. So I hope that you can kind of see which fonts and which which English words correlate with which portions of Chinese. Before I get into what this, how this word is constructed, I would like to just let you know a couple things about Chinese. Um, first of all, each Chinese word fills an invisible square. So you see that the word on the left in the black font and the word on the right in the green font, they fill approximately the same space because they're both filling an invisible square. The other thing I would say about Chinese is that it does not have an alphabet. You may be wondering how could they have a, a writing system that is separate and divorced from an alphabet system, but I'm going to explain that a little further in the lesson. The other thing I would explain about Chinese is that some Chinese script represents pictures and some represent ideas. So a Chinese word that represents a picture is called a pictograph. And a Chinese word that represents an idea or a concept is called an ideograph. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at two, ide two ideographs. The word on the left in the black font at the top of your screen is an ideograph. And the word on the right in the green font is also an ideograph. It's partially a pictograph, but I would say it's more of an ideograph. So let's get into our lesson. I decided to choose the word repent to go along with my lesson or my videos on Noah. So earlier I shared my poem, Noah Hark, and I also shared a video in which I discussed the poem, Noah Hark. In that video, I spoke about the symbolism to some extent of the Ark, Noah's Ark, and the fact that it represents salvation. The fact that getting on that boat or on that ship, there's more a ship than a boat, I would think, was God painting a picture of what salvation is like. When we give our life to Jesus, then he, rescu he rescues us from destruction, from death, you know, particularly spiritual death. You know, spiritual death is separation from God. When we are separated from God, we are separated from everything that God re represents. And God represents life. God is life. So when we're separated from him, anything that makes life pleasant, anything that makes life beautiful, we won't experience those things at all. 
So that's what hell is, is, is really. I know a lot of people don't believe in hell, but hell is a real place. So Noah's Ark is actually a picture of God saving us from hell and being eternally, spiritually dead. Okay, because, you know, and you may say, but how could you be spiritually dead when you're conscious and alive and all of those things? If you're not a believer, you may have those questions. But spiritual death and physical death could be two different things. You know, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God told them they could eat up any fruit, told them they could eat up any of the trees of the garden except for one, except for one. He said, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And I think when he said that, they probably thought that what he meant was that they would physically die. But when they ate the fruit, they did not physically die. They died spiritually. Their friendship with God was aborted. So um, that's what spiritual death is a picture of. Spiritual death is a picture of essentially when we are dead spiritually we can't hear God's voice we don't experience God's grace um usually um at least not on a consistent basis or the kind of cons with the kind of consistency that you would if you were walking with God on a daily basis so that's what spiritual death looks like anyway let's get into the lesson the word at the top of the screen on the left in the black font and on the right in the green font represents the word repent in Chinese. I'm not going to focus too much on the pronunciation because I think it will be challenging enough just to get used to the script. And yes, you can get used to the script. There is a lot of logic behind it. And even though it is thousands of years old, it makes a lot of sense just because, you know, life in a sense is timeless. What people were like tens of thousands years of years ago is not that different from what people are like, what life is like now in, 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 in the essence of things. So even though the script is thousands of years old, it still makes a lot of sense and we can still relate to it. So the word that we're looking at here at the top of your screen is a word for repent. And let's see how the Chinese define it. On the left, in the black font, we have the word that represents regret. And on the right, we have the word that represents, you know, it's in green font, it represents change, transformation, and correct. So we have two different words coming together to form one complete word. And if you're familiar with German and how German verbs are formed, you would see that uh, there is a similarity between Chinese and German in that regard. So for example, if you think of the word kindergarten, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but kinder means child. And garden means garden. So kindergarten is kindergarten. You know, kindergarten is child, a garden for children, you know, a place for children to play and explore and learn. So that's the word for kindergarten. And um, so Chinese is similar. You can have like these compound words that would actually be two or more words coming together to form a single word. So many Chinese words are like that. Not necessarily all Chinese words, but many of them would be composed of two or three, sometimes four. I think that's kind of rare though, but at least two or three mm, different words. All right. So in this case, we have the word regret and transform coming together to form the word repent. And whether you're a believer or whether you're not a believer, does this make sense to you? I'm going to give you a little while to think about it. Repent means regret and 
change and transformation and correct. That's in a verb, you know, like to correct, correct uh, some type of behavior. Okay, yes, I think we would say that this does make sense. When we repent, at least true repentance, you do have to regret missing God's mark, as we say in Christian circles, you know, falling short of the standard that God has set for humanity. And it is because we fall short of that standard that we are in grave danger if we do not come to God and say, you know, God, I'm sorry. I want to walk in your ways. I want to submit to you. I want to obey you. I want to give my heart and my life to you. Unless we do that, we are, we run the risk of ending up spending an eternity in hell. Okay, but clearly, Regret is just one aspect of repentance. The other aspect is represented by the green portion of this word, which is change, transform, correct. So true repentance, you know that somebody has truly repented if they bear the fruit of repentance, which is change, transformation, and correcting incorrect behavior. So the green portion could be change, transform, correct, or reform. So when we repent, we change direction. If we were going north, we go south. We were going west, we go east. So that's change, going in the opposite direction from where we were, were originally headed. Repentance is also about transformation. So I think the best example I could think of is like the transformation of a caterpillar to a butterfly. A caterpillar is so very different from what it ultimately becomes, which is a butterfly. The other thing about a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is that that whole process of metamorphosis is quite gradual. It doesn't happen in a blink. Not usually, I don't think. So transformation in Christ is usually a gradual thing. Different people have different experiences. Some people, when they come to Christ, they experience dramatic transformations immediately. Especially, I think, if they were living a life of great immorality. But even if they experience very um, dramatic, quick, rapid, immediate changes that are evident to most of the people around them, they still go through a gradual process of change throughout the rest of their life. You know, you may have seasons of time where you experience growth spurts and you change quickly and so on, but generally walking with God is about gradual transformation. The other thing is, when we come to Christ, God says that he makes us into a new creature. And when you think about it, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is like the caterpillar becoming a new creature. The other thing is, when we repent, we correct previous behavior or lifestyles, or more importantly, ways of thinking that do not line up with the way that God thinks or with God's nature. So that's the other thing about repentance. And then also repentance could, could indicate being reformed, reformed. When you think of reform, I think of form as shape, you reshape something. Reform is also about structural, change on the inside like not sloppy change but structural change 
where your insights are reconfigured and refashioned and reformed to be able to adequately carry God's purpose, to be a beautiful place for God's spirit to dwell or to indwell. And so that's another part of reformation or another part of repentance. So I think that that's pretty, pretty clear. And I could speak about my own experience. Um, when I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I did not experience dramatic transformation. As a matter of fact, when I gave my heart to Jesus, I didn't feel anything at all. So I thought something was wrong with me because I knew about people who would give their who would have given their lives to Christ and cried or experienced some incredible burst of joy or a feeling of God's love and his grace and things like that. I felt absolutely nothing at all. But I was saved. I mean, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I repented of my sins. I itemized the things that I knew I was aware that I had done that I didn't think were pleasing to God. And felt nothing at all. But I did eventually gradually start to change. For example, when I was in high school, I must say, I read some books that I really should have not read. And, um, you know, some of these um, books that teenagers like to read, you know, when you're curious about um, adult things like sex, especially, you know? Oh yeah, that's what we would be curious about. And so I read some books that I know I shouldn't, well, I mean, at the time that I was reading them, I, I don't think I was really, you know, thinking too much about the fact that, you know, I really shouldn't be reading these books. But when I gave my heart to Christ, God eventually, in different ways, I guess, made it clear to me that that was wrong. So in obedience to God, I stopped reading those books. I put them aside when I went into bookstores and I saw the racks with those kinds of books on them, I would walk away. I would stay far from them. I didn't even want to be tempted to pick one up or flip through or buy one or anything like that. So that's one way in which I changed when I came to Christ. And that happened pretty quickly. But the other way in which I changed was that I, I gradually became more confident. My personality became more jovial where even I was so pressed down by the things that were happening in my life at the time where to the extent where I couldn't even really laugh. I didn't even know how to laugh. I know that may sound strange, but I, I had so little joy. I had no joy in my heart. Not because I was a bad person, because I was actually a pretty nice, good person and everything, but just had a very difficult life. I was having a very difficult time at that point in my life and I really wasn't happy. But God poured new joy into my heart. And, you know, I became somebody over, over a period of time, a couple of years, I became somebody who was known for my hearty laughter, you know. So God really did change me and I was transformed and I'm still in a process of metamorphosis where I'm becoming a more and more beautiful butterfly or I'm transforming from a caterpillar into a butterfly. But God really is fashioning me into a new creature. And he's fashioning me into a creature that looks more and more like God. You know, like Jesus said, if you see me, you see the father. It's that kind of dynamic, that kind of picture. God is reforming me or reshaping me so that I bear closer resemblance in nature, in the way that I think, in the way that I treat people to him so that I would be more and more like him. So that is essentially what repentance is about. And I think that the word in Chinese, these two words capture it 
perfectly. Sometimes when I want to understand a word in English a little better, sometimes I actually would look up the word in Chinese because I feel like Chinese often gives a very pure definition of what a word is. And I love how Chinese analyzes, analyzes deep issues and then pulls all kinds of different elements together to represent these kind of complex ideas, but in a very simple way. So let's look a little more closely at these two words. They are represented at the bottom of the screen in color coding that matches the, the text and the fonts at, and the script at the top of the screen. So let's look at the word on the left, which means regret. It's divided into two different components. On the left, we have a, 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 an element that means the heart. It could be the physical heart or it could be the intangible heart where we process our thoughts and emotions. The portion on the right represents the word for each. And what do you think of that? Does that represent? Does, how, what does that make you think of when you think of regret? What do you think of? Does that make sense? And by the way, I know that you may be wondering, how could that be heart and how could that be each? That doesn't look like heart and that doesn't look like each. But I just would encourage you to take it by faith because if you were to see what a lot of Chinese script originally looked like, you would realize that um, they were more pictorial and they were a bit more graphic. And But over time, over hundreds and thousands of years, the script has become more stylized, I think, to make it easier and more convenient and faster to write. Because, I mean, think about it. If you're writing an essay in Chinese, you'll be writing forever if you literally have to draw each word like a separate piece of art. So they have stylized the characters to make them uh, more convenient for communication or to make communication more convenient. So on the left, we have the heart and on the right, we have the word each. And I'm gonna give you a little time to think about that. How do you think that represents the word regret? And by the way, there are no wrong or right answers. As long as what you say is logical and can be logically explained and rationally explained, it would be acceptable because Chinese script is very similar to poetry. There are so many layers to many of the words that, you know, I do think that whether the originators of the script in we're intentionally layering the font or not. It's so, it is so infused with truth that you will find truth on many different levels in many different words. So let me give you some time to think about the connection between heart and each and why heart and each should come together to represent the word regret. If you want, you can pause the video and give yourself some time to muse on that and think about it. Okay, so here's what I think. And you could feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section, you know, what you were thinking about these elements coming together. Well, first of all, you cannot have true regret that is simply a mind thing. Regret is something that comes from the heart, not just from the mind or your brain. It's a heart thing, right? It's a heart thing. The It's something that comes from the inside of us, that part of us that Maybe we can't see physically, but that we can feel and that we can experience. And what about each? I think that 
when we regret something, we shouldn't cherry pick. We should regret each and everything in our life that is not pleasing to God. Or each and everything in our life that hurt somebody in some way that God may not be pleased with. Now, one thing that I should explain is that each, this component um, combines at the top. You see that even the word each is divided into two separate parts. There's a portion at the top. It looks almost like a sideways T and then a portion at the bottom, okay? The portion at the top represents grass and the portion at the bottom represents a nursing mother. And yes, I know, how does that represent grass and a nursing mother? Thank you for taking it by faith. Um, that's what it represents. And um, so in my research, I discovered that this element in this script may not only have the sense of the word each, but it could also represent flourish, the word flourish. So you've got the idea of the grass, the nursing mother, you get this idea of something flourishing. So when we have no kind of conscience and we don't regret anything that we do where we deliberately and maliciously maybe hurt other people, then we cannot flourish in life, not on the inside, certainly not on the inside. We may have all the wealth all the prestige, all the power, all the fame, all the things that any human being may want. But if we regret nothing that we do that hurts other people, and especially that is not pleasing to God, then we cannot flourish on the inside. We would kind of wither up and dry up and experience the same kind of spiritual death that Adam and Eve did to greater and greater degrees. So regret is an important part of human experience. If we go through life not regretting anything, then essentially we're narcissists because nobody is perfect and we don't, we don't always get things right. Um, we may not necessarily hurt people, but we may do things where we think, oh my goodness, um, I made a mistake there. I wish I had done that differently, you know, something like that. You know, that begins in the heart with a conscience that is sensitive. And the more that we do the wrong thing and not regret it, is the more that our conscious, is the more that our conscience becomes dysfunctional. So regret is a very important thing for all human beings to experience. And one thing I can say is that when we come to Christ and we repent, if we know that we're a narcissist or we generally don't care if we hurt people, even if we just come to God and we say, God, you know, I know this isn't good enough and I really would like to be a, a better human being and I'd like to be more like you, then God will by his grace, help us to change and he would restore our conscience if our conscience is inactive or dysfunctional. So that's one of the wonderful things about repenting and giving our heart to Jesus Christ. One of the things that I should also point out about this word on the left, the word regret in the black font, is that it represents what 75% of Chinese characters are like. Remember I told you that in Chinese there is no alphabet? Well, this word will give you a, a, an illustration of how they get around that. So on the left, you have something called a radical. That's a heart. The heart is a radical. It's an element of a word that gives you some idea of what the core meaning is or what the essence of the word is about. So we can't have regret unless something significant or meaningful happens in our heart. Not our physical heart, but our intangible heart. On the right, we have a phonetic component, which gives some approximation of the sound. It may not give an indication of the exact sound, but it gives some close idea 
of what the sound of the word should be. So in this case, this word is pronounced way or way. And the word, um, the element on the right, which could be a word by itself, each could be a word by itself. That word is pronounced may. So regret is pronounced way and the phonetic element is pronounced may. So as you can see in this case, the phonetic element rhymes with the pronunciation for the word that it is a part of. Does that make sense? So each is pronounced, not harder, each. Each is pronounced may. And when you bring heart and each together, it's pronounced hui. And so they rhyme. And each, if I had never seen the word regret before, but had seen, but was familiar with each, then I could probably make an educated guess about what the pronunciation should be. And by the way, even though each can be a word on its own, the radical for heart, the radical that we see here, cannot be a word on its own. You will always see it together with some other element, as you do here with the word each. Okay, let's look at the word for change, transform, correct, reform, the green portion. Below, you can see that, char that character or that word or that script deconstructed. On the left, is an element that means self. And on the right is an element that means to hit or to strike. If you compare the script at the bottom of the screen, self and hit, with the green portion at the top, you would realize that they look slightly different, especially the self part. And sometimes Chinese script will um, modify things slightly so that they fit into the invisible square that we spoke about at the beginning of the video, so that they fit properly in that square, and so that the script itself is artistically pleasing and balanced. So you could say, oh gosh, but it doesn't look exactly the same. It doesn't have to, because once you can see that, well, you know, it's, it's similar enough, I can figure out what it is, then that's the important thing. I mean, think about it like this. When we write words in English, one person may write a T one way and a T a, and somebody else write the T a different way. But when you look at both types of handwriting, you would realize it's the same T or even the same person. One day they may write T one way, another day they write it another way. It's the same kind of concept, right? So it's not too difficult to understand. So on the left, we have self, and on the right, we have hit to represent the word change, transform, correct. And I would further indicate that the word for hit really represents a hand holding a stick. So it's essentially representing that something or somebody, in this case, it's somebody because it's self, is being hit with a stick. How do you think, I'm gonna give you some time to think about it. How do you think that correlates with change, transform, correct, reform? What do you think? Feel free to put your thoughts in the comment section. I would love to see, you know, what you're coming up with. And again, no answer is wrong as long as it is logical. It's, it's no different from poetry. You know, some people think that anything goes with poetry, but no. When we analyze poetry, it's supposed to be logical and make sense. Whatever we come up with, 
in terms of what we think a poem is saying, it's supposed to make sense. Not because something is poetry and artistic means that there's no logic to it. And it's the same thing with Chinese script. So give it some thought. Okay, here's what I think. And again, you know, there could be many different answers for this. God, the Holy Spirit may bring all kinds of different things to mind to me, to people watching this video. And, you know, if you're a believer, as the Bible says, we all have the mind of Christ. So let's see what we come up with together. This is what I think. So to repent means to change, of course. And who's changing? I am changing. Myself, I am changing. And sometimes changing is not pleasant. It's discipline. It, it's all about discipline, you know. You may feel as if God is, you know, the Bible says that when God disciplines us, the Bible says that God disciplines his children, the ones that he loves, he disciplines. And it's not always pleasant. But without discipline, we cannot change. Without God correcting us, without God weeding things out of our heart, we cannot change. And I think that that's what change, transformation, correction, reformation can feel like. It, it, can, it can feel like God's discipline, like God is hitting us with a stick it could also be us hitting ourselves with a stick like where we ourselves don't just wait for God to initiate everything in our lives we we can go to God and say you know God I did something today that I that I'm not happy about because I know it's not pleasing to you and we ourselves can take a stick and hit ourselves and say that was wrong we could pinch ourselves, give our own selves a wake up call. And, you know, one of the ways I remember doing that, me personally, is like, I remember when I was pretty young, probably in my 20s, I started feeling a little jealous of somebody who I really admired, but who had everything going for them. Everything seemed to go right for them. And for me, it felt like everything was always going wrong. And of course, that's what jealousy is like, right? It's a mixture of admiration and hatred, you know? But when this feeling came into my heart, I knew that it was wrong. So what I did was I psychologically pinched myself and I said Nika I spoke to myself in very stern in a very stern way and I said Nika that's wrong and we won't be entertaining that don't be petty don't be small-minded and um, to, to deal with that challenge because jealousy is a very tricky thing to deal with if you don't nip it in the bud it will overtake your, it will overtake your thoughts and your feelings and it will corrupt your character and it's very corrosive. So what I did was I, um, what I did was I prayed for the person and I thanked God for them. And I said, I said, I, I spoke to God and I said, God, thank you for such and such a person. Thank you for everything that you've given to them. Thank you for blessing them. Thank you for blessing them even more. And thank you, God, that, that what you have done for them, you can also do for me. So I don't have to be jealous. And God, I know that jealousy is wrong. So I give this feeling to you and I thank you for helping me. And who, who I tell you that feeling of jealousy didn't run, didn't, didn't, didn't just evaporate. Because why? Because it wasn't necessarily something that was 
absolutely originating in my heart. I think it was just the, the enemy or forces of darkness trying to plant seeds, poisonous seeds in my heart. And if I had entertained those thoughts and given myself over to that feeling of envy, I'd be a very different person today. If I did not, going back to regret, if I, in my heart, did not regret having those feelings, then I would not be flourishing on the inside in my soul the way that I do today. Jealousy or envy is, a, is something that is very diminishing. It really makes you small, 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 small. Makes you wither up on the inside. It dries up your joy. It drives up, dries up your ability to see things properly. You know, it dries up your spiritual sight and insight. Anything, any kind of attitude or behavior that we entertain that does not reflect the perfect nature of God is going to make us make us it's going to make us that much blinder and that much smaller. So as you can see, repent is not a very simple word. There are a lot of things that are connected to the word repent and Chinese encapsulates it beautifully. Imagine all the things that I thought that you could probably fill pages and pages in a notebook with are encapsulated in these few simple lines of Chinese script. One thing I would say is that, one thing I would say is that the script is not all that difficult to learn because the different elements that you see in different words are often recycled among the different, the thousands of different Chinese words. You'll see the same elements over and over. So you get used to seeing them. And, um, you know, for example, the radical for heart, you see that in many different words. The, the portion each, you see that in many different words. Self, you see that in many different words. Hit, you see that in many different words. So the fact that the script is recycled, you know, makes it easy to recognize and eventually you get used to it, you know. And um, the other thing is that, the other thing is that I would say there are many people who look at the script and think, oh my goodness, Chinese must be a super difficult language when it's not that difficult, you know. It's it is not as intimidating as it looks. And it's one of the simplest languages to learn simply because the grammar is very simple, extremely simple, simpler than English and simpler than Spanish, if you know either of those languages, simpler than French, simpler than German, the, you know, simpler than Japanese even. The, the, the Chinese grammar is very, very basic not unintelligent it's very intelligent but the way it's designed it makes it very easy to learn the language and as for the script the script learning how to write the script is perhaps the hardest part of the language but it's also the part that generally when i've taught chinese that my students have always said is the most fun it's very therapeutic because to learn how to write the script, you have to write it over and over in the sequence in which it's supposed to be written. So each word is written in a particular sequence. And once you learn the sequence, which you learn by writing the script over and over, then it sticks a lot better. It's easier to memorize and it's very therapeutic. There's something about writing the script over and over that's very therapeutic. I think part of it is a repetition and part of it is just the artistic design of the script. I think as you get accustomed to the script, you realize that Chinese words carry a lot of artistic value. They have symmetry, they have, um, they have symmetry, they have beautiful balance. They are, um, they make good use of space. They're well composed. Um, so they're very artistic. So I think that the 
therapeutic value of Chinese is connected to the fact that the script has to be written over and over and over to memorize it. And then the other thing is that it's artistic and art, especially if it's beautiful, I think, I know, I know that art therapists would disagree with me, but I think that art, especially if it's beautiful, and it is pleasing to the soul is therapeutic. So that's it for repent. Have you repented? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? If you haven't, what are you waiting for? If you close your eyes tonight and they never open again, where will you find yourself? You should ask yourself questions like that. You know, think beyond today and tomorrow think about eternity because eternity is forever and it doesn't end and wherever you find yourself on the other side of this divide on the other side of time that's probably where you're going to be forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever so if you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to, you know, start getting to know God, get a Bible, read it, investigate, ask whatever questions you need to ask. But don't take too long because tomorrow is not guaranteed. And as I've heard one very wise teacher say, hell is a place of regret. It really is. People who are in hell right now are kicking themselves for not having done what is a very simple thing to do, which is to simply take a, a step towards God and say, God, I need you to be humble enough to submit to God who is, who is our creator and to regret that in many different ways, we have disappointed him or we've not met his standard or regret that we've taken so long to get to the point where we give our lives to Christ, regret if we've been rebellious or, or arrogant or full of pride or, you know, whatever it may be. And, um, and then, you know, once we do that, we will embark on a beautiful journey of transformation and adventure in Christ. I could tell you that living for God is not easy because God says that those who find him, those who walk with him, walk a very narrow pathway, right? The pathway of the righteous is narrow. A narrow meaning that it's, you know, the options for having your own way and so on could be quite limited but um and it can also be difficult like filled with obstacles and challenges but it's beautiful i mean i love being able to feel god's peace in my heart his comfort to hear his voice every day which is the most beautiful thing in the whole universe you know, to have God advise me, counsel me, comfort me, be my friend, work out the circumstances in my life, um, fill my heart with joy, make jokes with me sometimes, put, it, put beautiful songs in my heart, bring out talents out of me that I never even knew I had and that I would have never discovered if I wasn't plugged into Jesus Christ. Life in God is beautiful and whatever price we pay will always always be worth it so yes repent if you have not repented yet so that's it for this video if you enjoyed this please give it a thumbs up if you have any questions feel free to let me know if there's something if there's something that maybe I did not cover properly or you have a question about, please feel free to let me know and I'll try to answer in the comments section. Until next time. And that's it.